Uh, okay, hi everyone. Uh, sorry for short delay. And today we will listen to a talk about continuous localization, a very important topic. And uh, we have Dwayne and Ryan to talk about it. And what can I say? Dwayne has been involved with open source since 2001 and worked with portal and translation toolkit. And Ryan works with him and Let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks very much for having us. Um, so I'm Dwayne. I work with Translate Pass and working on Poodle for quite a while. Um, I'm kind of the, one of the founding creators of the software. Um, Ryan's the lead developer at the moment. Um, and our focus today is looking at continuous localization, both in terms of how it is able to be done and um, maybe some of the things that we need to take um, forward in terms of open source. So just a little bit of background in terms of history of uh, us as an organization and what we've been involved in. Um, I'm from South Africa and um, so we're working on the official languages of South Africa, so translating open source software, um, basically because it was the most powerful vehicle we had um, to influence software and to change the way software worked. In fact, it was quite a critical thing to get um, other, other people like Microsoft actually translating software by, by translating something like, um, at the time, OpenOffice. Um, that moved into an Africa-wide network. Um, looking at uh, issues of localization across the continent. And at the moment we focus on kind of worldwide issues and trying to help teams that, that are localizing across the world. Um, the reason why we got into t tools and tooling was really to address um, some of the shortcomings we saw in open source. So every tool that we developed was trying to tackle something. Poodle specifically was designed because we were struggling to get good tools into the hands of localizers. Um, but we both things like uh, the Translate Toolkit, which looks at uh, quality uh, checks and does format conversion. So that was also about how to enable localizers. Uh, we have a tool called Fatal, which is an offline translation tool. Um, and then Amagama, which is a massive uh, free and open source software translation memory. Um, 2004 is when we launched um, Poodle, and my daughter was young there. Um, and now Poodle is a teenager and so is my daughter, so um, it's grown up, it's stronger, but it's a little bit more opinionated now as well. So, so the time I've been involved in localization and I'm a bit of an, um, an accidental localizer. My training is in mechanical engineering, but I got involved in localization because of the impact it could have on, on people. Um, but we've seen some of that process and I'm, I'm not a localizer from the 80s, but really the, the systems that we've had in place um, and, and, and in some projects are still active, it's, it's a matter of uh, getting work via email, um, translating it, sending it back to review, sending it back to be fixed, um, landing it, and then a few months later actually releasing it. But things have changed um, over the years. Um, some of the things that we saw, the first translation of Microsoft software into a South African language would never actually go be translated again. So there were mistakes um, and they wouldn't be fixed. They would just roll over to the next. And that's very much an old school view um, that people have moved out of. Um, in a space where people were translating 10, 15, if you were a radically progressive organization, you'd probably be doing 35 languages. Um, but the first thing we start seeing, um, we, we see it happen even with Ubuntu, um, just exposing translations to, to other people and making it a little bit divorced from um, the actual release. We see Microsoft started, started doing language pack concepts and getting that out. And we see quite quickly Facebook and Twitter doing massive community-based localizations. And we're looking at things like hundreds of languages. So in, in the present day, we are looking at um, we're looking at, at translation processes that need, need to deal with lots and lots of languages. Um, and that's the reality we're in. The world's changing. Um, you're having to deliver rapidly. You're having to think about mobile and web apps. You've got multiple different targets. Um, you've got new markets. 20% of the web um, 
um, our native English speakers and the rest are growing. All the languages that are really growing um, in terms of multi-digit percent every year or things like Russian, Chinese, Spanish is counted there as well. English is growing but not as big as these other languages and more and more people are coming on board with mobile. In fact, I think it's 2013 was the year in which more people were using mobile to access the web than were using desktops. So a very, very dynamic change and a very dynamic change in the environment. And that's kind of why we're having to look at um, continuous localization, certainly in the open source space. I just wanted to quickly valorize um, localizers because um, I don't think we spend enough time focusing on the, the effort that they put in and why we want to look at continuous localization from that um, to, to assist them. Um, often localization processes are really built around the developers. They, they're built to um, support the development process. Um, and it's time that we honor the people who work really, really hard across often multiple projects, multiple formats, multiple tools, etc., etc., etc. A kind of environment that, that developers are not really, really um, used to. But people are really, really passionate about advancing their language. And so that's some of the motivation of why continuous localization is critical because it's about how do we make these people really, really effective. Some of the processes that we've seen over the years that we want to try look at fixing and we think continuous localization is part of um, what fix that. Um, strangely enough, if, if you're looking at continuous localization as, as things moving more quickly, um, we feel that some of the, the way you can approach continuous localization um, will actually effectively reduce the load on um, translators, um, really focusing on which, thing, which things are more important than other things, um, providing much more context in a way of, of translators getting context that they might not, not usually do, having a strong focus on quality in the same way that continuous integration looks at checks, um, having really quick processes that can allow strings to be turned around very, very quickly, and actually breaking, breaking the concept, which I think a lot of people have loved for too long, of string freezes, that there's a deadline at which you can't change things, but actually creating a system that is much, much more dynamic. The key ideas for us in terms of uh, continuous localization um, is really trying to look at reducing the friction in the process. So which are the processes that require manual intervention um, or, or intervention that is, is um, not helpful for the localization process? How do, you, how do you oil those well? How do you eliminate them? Or how do you reduce the cost of them? Um, obviously, reducing and eliminating manual processes because they become blockers in terms of uh, process. Organizational memory is a critical thing, and Ryan will talk much more to it, in terms of how do we learn and how do we continue to learn within the space of translation. It's quite critical in open source because we have a flow and movement of translators all the time. Um, the visibility of progress, so people can see what they're working on, what they should be working on. Um, the critical thing for me as well is how do we empower the right people, expecting developers to make comments about the strings that need to translate, um, where a translator might have a much better context and a much better <coughs> idea of how that impacts their language. I'd rather empower the translator in that, con in that context. Um, and the other thing that we, we see continuous localization helping is the idea of releasing early and often. So not re working out processes that allow us to, to push languages out as quickly as they are ready um, and to do that continually, which is more a reflection of, of the reality. So I just wanted to quickly leap into the things that we feel that people should be doing right now if you're not doing anything around um, continuous localization. Um, the first most critical thing, and we see it too often, is that bad translations and broken translations can break products. Um, so we have a strong belief that translations, we want to catch those, those problems earlier, but as a first step, nothing that you send out as a product, if it's mistranslated in some way, should be able to break the product. So I mean, actually physically breaking it, that you get a trace back or a crash. And that happens too often, and we still let that, we're still working in a space sometimes in open source where we allow that to happen. So we need to break that. Um, if you are currently using continuous integration, and I doubt there's very pe many people who don't do that, it's kind of critical that you're starting to look at um, localization being part of that. 
um, catching localization related errors, whether it's breakages in the, in the translations that you can actually automate and detect, whether it's extraction of strings that you haven't done. Those kind of things need to be put into your process right now. Um, and I'd recommend people start looking at one of our tools, which is the Translate Toolkit, and actually start looking at how you can automate um, some of that in, in terms of the build environment so that you're not actually allowing um, translations that break products to enter into, 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 the, um, into, into the build and, and never get out. Um, I'm going to hand over to Ryan, who's going to take stuff and look at, look at it much more from, uh, from a continuous integration model in terms of what we're trying to do. Yeah, hi. So we've worked with software for years, both Dwayne and myself, and one thing we saw very clearly was that uh, using continuous integration techniques allowed us to both improve the quality of the software and speed up that process. And so the big question for us really were, <clears throat> can we apply those processes to localization? And I think a, 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 a similar question really that we've asked is, are there any <coughs> processes in localization specific to that, that that could also assist in terms of uh, continuous integra integration and continuous localization. So within, <coughs> so within, um, so within localization, obviously we have quality checks, and as, ben, as Dwayne mentioned just previously, uh, the Translate Toolkit provides many such checks. Um, I think the, the ultimate aim is to prevent uh, the strings ever reaching the build process so that they don't break builds and they don't break uh, the build product. But I think with continuous inter integration, it's not just about fixing bugs, it's about taking the process. So it's about stepping back and saying, <clears throat> you know, what, what was the cause of that bug and putting in place the process to prevent that. And then even further, taking a further step back and saying, what causes that class of bugs and how can we prevent those, that class of bugs from happening? <clears throat> Within uh, localization, there's obviously already um, the, the quality checks, but that also provides metrics. It's not simply about whether or not a build can pass or fail. It's also about whether or not uh, the developers and localizers have sight of change uh, in, in, the, in the process. So I think one of the things we've been really looking at recently is um, really two different sets of checks. And if we use GitHub, um, I think other uh, repositories have similar uh, mechanisms, but it can show you basically if your, your uh, continuous integration tests are failing or uh, other metrics about any change that you're proposing. And really what we'd like to do is to have something similar. So when developers make commits to, to the branch, they can see this has added so many strings. The translators can, can see that those strings have been added straight away. And then on the flip side, when the translations are being committed to the repository, the checks that are currently happening in the translation environment could also potentially be happening at that point of change. So another key aspect is improving the communication. Uh, for, for localizers, uh, one of the most challenging parts of their job is really getting the context of, of what that string um, is used for. Uh, the same string obviously could, could, could uh, or the same uh, words could mean quite different things in different contexts. So for, for translators that takes up a, a large amount of their time trying to get the context uh, to, to give an appropriate uh, translation. So one thing we'd really like to look at is how we can improve that communication flow between the developers and then conversely uh, back from the developers to the translators. But there's also a lot within a language team um, that, that, that could be improved. The kind of checks uh, that people develop um, are, are quite often specific to their language, but quite often they're not, and they, they work uh, with other languages as well. So really what we're looking at is how we can increase uh, communication within language teams, between language teams, and with language teams to developers. So, just taking a quick step back, <coughs> um, 10, 15 years ago, developing software, if a project was forked, it was really seen as the absolute worst thing that could happen to a project, pretty much the death knell of a project. And GitHub came along and basically started encouraging people to fork, and they, they kind of put this ribbon on, uh, people put this ribbon on the website saying, you know, fork me on GitHub. And that really changed the way in which people saw software forking. Um, 
Nowadays, most projects will look on their GitHub page or what have you, and they'll, they'll regard it as a success metric that more people are forking their software. Quite, quite the opposite to what happened in the past. In part, that change has come about just because of distributed versioning. Um, it allows you to have local branches uh, more easily, uh, push changes between those local branches, but also have a shared upstream or, or even potentially uh, multiple shared upstreams. Well, I think the real change came not with distributed versioning, it came with the pull request, because the pull request allowed you to not only fork, but to offer those changes back and to, to, to make it very clear what changes you were offering back um, to, 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 the, to the core branch. So I think for, for localization to adopt some of those practices, really uh, the area that we're looking at right now is how we can, how we can branch and how we can, how we can diff and how we can merge those changes back how we can apply that very successful process from software into the localization process. <coughs> so, I mean, we've developed Poodle, but I, I know that others are looking at uh, similar technologies. I think a pretty critical part to making it frictionless is that BCS hookup. So as soon as developers are committing strings, they're appearing in whatever tool that you use to localize. And conversely, as soon as you're making uh, changes or soon after you're, you're making changes to your localization, those are appearing back in the, in, in the repository. Poodle started out mostly as a file-based editor, and even now, even very large, complex projects tend to have a very file-based view of localization. Um, and one of the things that we're, we're moving towards is much more seeing localization as a data source, so we can work not just with profiles, what have you, but directly with databases, or potentially even with websites or, or, or other uh, sources of localization. So, as I said before, previously we worked mostly with PO. Um, nowadays, the, the uh, localization uh, landscape has, has dramatically changed, and even within a single project, you're likely to see more than one localization format. So that's a, that's a pretty critical aspect, being able to integrate with those projects, is being able to work with the, with, with the variety of formats that they work with. So there are some technologies that are quite specific to localization and are pretty relevant in terms of building that organizational memory. I think translation memory being probably the most obvious one. Um, if, for those that aren't aware, it allows you to see how a string was translated previously and gives you some prompts in, 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 in how you might translate it. The other, the other one that's a, a pretty significant aspect and, and, and very much increasingly so is machine translation. Um, historically, machine translation has been pretty poor. That's changing pretty quickly, um, but it's also useful as, as an aid to speed up that localization process. Even if it doesn't give you a perfect string, it can give you some pretty good prompts. So uh, just finishing up, just within Translate House, our uh, main goal around this is to support more uh, free and open source projects. Uh, we're, we're very much from the sort of free and open source world, and I think for most within our organization, that, that's our, our main aim, is to see uh, as much open source software localized in as many languages as, as possible. But we'd like to make localization a given. I mean, walking around the conference, talking to people, even now, many, many big projects just don't localize their software. And I think nowadays the technology is there that makes it a lot easier and the internet has meant that the market is so much greater, so the need to do that is so much more. So, final thing just to say, we're looking for any, uh, well, we're always looking for localizers, but we're also looking for coders who might uh, have a passion around localization or, you know, widening participation in, in the internet and the web more generally. So, any, any questions? You want to come up and ask questions, please? Hi, so um, if you plan to use like a unified uh, storage system for uh, localization, um, how would you put it together given that different uh, localization formats have different feature sets? So some ha may have plural, some may not have plural, some may like l 10 RAM has a lot of extra features. So how would you do that in a unified storage model? 
Uh, I'm assuming that specifically in terms of Poodle. Uh, currently, Poodle still uses an internal representation that's pretty much like Po, which gives it some limitations, but Po is a pretty robust format, so you can express most of the other formats in that way. Um, but I would say, I mean, for us, the answer to that question is Poodle. Poodle is where we bring localizations from, from different projects, from different formats, and we put them into one place where localizers can see them uh, in, 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 one, you know, in one interface. I think the critical thing as well in terms of um, comparison and diffing and that kind of stuff is the, the needs of localization in terms of the diff. Um, the camera are different. Like we don't really want to see um, how the layouts or the formatting change. We want to see the content of the string that changed. Um, and that, that's really what we're wanting to see diffed in, in terms of the differences that are coming from different places and work out how to merge them. Talking, talking about um, teams and building up with localizations, um, what would you suggest if there's someone showing up with a rare language that's not in the local database, no GLibc support or anything, so a new language, do you, do you recommend they will start translating the profiles or go to the, to the source first? so that they get support for the, yes, the basics. So um, my kind of view is not to discourage anyone. Do you think it's a question? Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Um, so I think my, I mean, my passion is to see even the, the, most, the smallest language like um, active and activated. Um, on a Linux system, not having a glibc locale can be a bit of a barrier, um, but a lot of, a lot of places it, it, it isn't. Um, the stuff, well, we, in, in the kind of African context, we tackled the lo missing locale problem by just making it go away. Um, and we addressed that, we built like 100 locales. Um, I would encourage someone like that to look at building a locale. I've, I haven't looked at it for a while, whether the CLDR data is pulled directly into GLibc. But that would probably be the most effective way of actually doing it. Um, they're not very hard to do. Um, if you, if you basically read South African English one, because I documented it all. <laughs> but my thing would be, I think the critical takeaway for me is, I don't like seeing any barriers prevent someone. So I'd rather help someone like that tackle the GLibc locale thing, because it'll go away. Once that's done, it's literally gone, and then they're free to carry on. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Um, I worked together with the Asteroid OS team to manage translations there. And one of the troubles we're running into is that we have um, the applications which are all Qt, so we have the Qt translation system for all the strings in the application. And then we have the desktop files, which, all, which contain the app name that also needs to be translated. We're currently using WebLate for that. Um, but we can only translate the in-app strings and we have to try to find a way to personally contact the translators to get the desktop entries translated. Do you have any tips on how to handle situations like that? Yeah, I'm not... Um, so, I'm, so you've got one part that's able to be translated in WebLate and one part that's not. That, that yeah, sense. the cute part is can be translated in WebLate, yeah. and the rest is a .desktop file, which WebLate doesn't support, and you can't... Oh, yeah, that's yeah. fine. So, I mean, I would look at the GNOME uh, tooling, which allows you to translate .desktop files, and that would convert it to PO, which might be an approach, because I'm pretty sure then you could translate it in PO format. Okay, thanks. <coughs>
You were talking about quality of translation earlier. What's your process to ensure that you have good quality translations because presumably different uh, translators will, in the same language, will have different, will translate differently? Sure. Um, so especially when you're dealing with volunteer translators, the metrics that I'm looking at is making sure um, that you've got, uh, depending on the maturity of the language, um, looking that you've got the resources that um, that enhance translation. So, well-defined terminology followed by translation memory. That would be how I try to look at consistency. Um, the thing that we want to see language language teams specifically do is actually build um, quality metric tests that can actually ensure that. But the critical thing we've found is that actually before translation memory is to get consistent terminology that relates to the domain that they're translating, and that's the kind of first step of getting of getting a consistency. I think part, part of the answer to that is uh, about tone as well, because somebody can translate something completely correctly, but it may not be the tone that was intended uh, when the string is used. So I think in, in that, one of the key things there is not necessarily a continuous uh, localization, it's literally reviewed. It's about working with those teams that can give the right uh, oversight and training to, to the localizers. Hi. So, as a French web developer, one of the recurring issues that we face is that when we translate uh, English text that fills um, a tiny button, we translate it in French and then it overflows um, uh, very often because French words are often longer than English words. Do you have any suggestion on how to handle that more systematically, like graphical screenshots or anything? And there are a few approaches. I wanted to. Um not have a UI that, that allows you to overflow. <laughs> um, because I think the reality with translations and the common problem is that um, all, all translations inflate from the original. So they will get bigger, like 20%, 10%, depends on the language. Um, there are a few approaches. One is to, 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 to physically place limits on, on things and put checks in place that limit that. The problem with that is that you end up with really difficult to understand translation. So my first thing would be actually looking at how you can adapt the UI to see if that's the first possibility. Um, in terms of screenshots and that, we've been toying with a bit of those ideas and thinking what we could do there. Um, the difficult with screenshots is trying to figure out how you could automate that a bit so that you um, you can see when things are flowing. Um, and I'm not sure how to do that. It's also worth mentioning in place localization. It's not something that Poodle does at the moment. It's something certainly we've considered uh, developing. Uh, but, but within place localization systems, you, know, you really go to the web page and you translate in the web page. So then the localizers can see the space available. But, but pretty much any localizer I've ever spoke to would say, that, that's not what we want. We want you to make an UI that's going to work for our translation. Okay. Any other questions? We have time. Keep your hand up. Thanks. Uh, I have a question that uh, about a feature that is usually uh, available in uh, translation software. It's about uh, terminology, which uh, wasn't mentioned there. Uh, so, uh, what is uh, your uh, your thoughts about uh, the extensive uses of uh, terminology in order to improve the quality of uh, translations? I think it depends a little bit on what's being translated. Um, last year, I was in India and working with some government organisations there, and the point they made is that. Um, Without the terminology, even within a single language, the same word, because it's a relatively new word, may be translated many different ways. And for, for uh, an organisation as big as the Indian government, they're dealing with, I think, eight, I think they've got eight, uh, you know, official large languages and many, many dialects. So, that, so I think terminology provides, uh, particularly for, you know, newer terms, uh, a, a way of standardising that and preventing it from, you know, being translated under different ways. 
So I think it's a very important part. I mean, I think addressing it in a continuous localization thing for me is I think often terminology is, is neglected, but it's really empowering the translators. That would be my passion is seeing the translators actually uh, developing the terminology that applies to the domain that they're localizing. So the, the words they have problems with, but that becomes the terminology for that um, problem domain. Hi there. Um, you were talking about, um, as a part of continuous integration, um, it's a good idea to try to take broken strings, for example. Um, how would you concretely go about that? It, does that mean you create a build of your software and then you have to kind of start it up and run through a bunch of acceptance tests to see that um, the software doesn't crash, for example, because of a you know weird string, or do you do screenshotting or this kind of thing, or? What's the approach there? So, I, uh, so the question is, um, how do you prevent strings from breaking builds, and how, how can you put in place those processes? Um, I think there's not a single answer to that. I think um, at the moment, for example, in Puzzle, you can translate things and it will show where there's critical errors. Uh, one of the things that we, we've talked about quite a lot and we'd like to add is uh, the ability to, to have something a bit like a pull request. So when somebody makes a bunch of changes, you could see that that's going to create so many critical critical checks, uh, critical fails. Um, the critical fails tend to be the kind of things that will break a bill. Um, ideally, they wouldn't get into your master translations. Ideally, they would, they, they would be reviewed, and as part of that review process, that would, that would be prevented. Um, much like with a pull request, if it goes off to Travis and it fails, people, people won't, won't land it. Um, but I think there's a second part to that, which we, we, we don't have yet, but something would be very nice to have, is, is literally at the point where pull requests are made, to, to, to push the translation strings, those checks are repeated again so the developers can see that coming in uh, to, to, their, to their repository. I mean, just to, to raise one of those things, I mean, we, I think we actually unpicked it from our app, but um, it's, a, it's an approach that I would do. Um, it's kind of like if you're looking at things as, as, as a defense, like walls of defense, the one was if a string does fail to be translated, so either you, something happens with when you're trying to get the, 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 the string, um, our app is using getx, so it's that approach. Um, or it fails to interpolate, so the variables are, are translated or broken in some way. And we fall back to English. So English is not ideal in a UI, but it's better than crashing or breaking. So that, that would be my first line of defense. But I think with, uh, with continuous localization, is trying to bring that further forward. Um, so a simple one would be if it is getx, even using getx itself to see if the, if the, if the file compiles. Um, and, on, and that you're not pushing it out with a compiled file um, that's broken, which is quite possible in certain contexts uh, when you're not necessarily using get text directly. Um, and then the translate toolkit will do things that we actually look for variables, and we can write tests that look for variables that are broken or XML that's broken, or et cetera. And, and XML becomes quite a problematic one where, um, especially if you're doing some kind of interpretation on it, you're expecting the XML to look a certain way. You've used names that look eminently translatable, like page or color, and people then translate it. So just building those checks in so that they, they're called right at the beginning. And those, so I think the, the critical thing in builds is that you, and, and the problem with some of the automated checks is that they do need to be a kind of 100% accurate. So you don't want, you can't really deal with false positives in that space. But there's enough, there are enough checks that you can build to catch those right there and prevent them ever, ever even going out. Thanks. Hi. Um, sort of related to the same question previously. Um, so if we already have, say, a, a test suite that we put the localizations through when they come in back from Poodle or Transfix or whatever we might be using at the time, um, would there be, um, would you envision some sort of mechanism or protocol whereby you could integrate your own systems to report back to maybe Portal if, say, the, 
the translators will will make 20 changes on 20 strings. And somehow that magically in the background creates a pull request, then the source control um, and the CI tools will come back and report and say, right, these two strings here failed with this error message and stuff like that. And would you uh, think of some, some integration tools to, to, to sort of limit the going back and forth and like helping translate things quicker? Um, I, th I think, and, and whether, whether, or, whether or not we could get that communication back into Poodle or into other tools, I mean, I don't see why not. In some respects, I would say that if it's, certainly in terms of how we're, we're, we're thinking this at the moment, if it's failing, uh, if it's failing in Poodle, it's going to fail on uh, landing into GitHub. It's going to run, I'm assuming it's going to run the same check. So, that, so that in, in Poodle, they would have that communication already. In terms of TransFX or other uh, online platforms, I mean, potentially we I think from my side, like the critical place to catch it is right in, in the tool itself. That would be my ideal. Um, like reporting back at a later date uh, works, but it does mean that the translator then is um, out of the loop. They're not on that string anymore. So the ideal would be to catch it earlier. I don't see any other questions. Thank you so much. And let's say it.